Are you he who is to come, or shall we look for another? Have you ever had to come to grips with the problem of unmet expectations? Have you ever had expectations of someone, maybe a friend or a loved one, maybe a coworker or an employee, or maybe even yourself, <coughs> expectations that were ultimately dashed? Let's take it a step further. Have you ever had expectations that went unmet in God? That question gives us one of the keys to understanding today's gospel passage from Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 11. The setting for this story is that because John the Baptist had been openly condemning Herod the Tetrarch of Galilee for having an illicit relationship with his brother's wife Herodias, Herod has John thrown in prison. This was an imprisonment that would result three chapters later in the gospel in John's beheading by Herod, his martyrdom. So the beginning of John's imprisonment then coincided closely with the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. And at this point in time, John has been picking up bits and pieces of information in prison about Jesus' ministry, and apparently it causes him to begin to wonder. There's a lot of speculation among theologians and scripture scholars about the true nature of John's question in verse 3 when he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you he who is to come, or shall we look for another? After all, John was Jesus' cousin. He knew him well. His mother Elizabeth surely had told him at some point about the revelation that she had received from the Holy Spirit about her cousin Mary's baby when Mary had come to visit her when both of the women were pregnant and how John leaped in Elizabeth's womb at the sound of Mary's voice. Beyond that, we know that John gave a clear acknowledgement of who Jesus was earlier when he said of him, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. John also testified that at the time that he baptized Jesus in the Jordan River, he saw the Holy Spirit descend upon him, and he heard the voice of the Father declare that Jesus was his Son. And John himself had declared that ultimately Jesus would be the one who would baptize people with the Holy Spirit. So how in the world... Could he now be asking the question, are you he who is to come, or shall we look for another? In effect, the gist of the question was, did I mistakenly baptize the wrong one? Again, the key to understanding John's question has to do with expectations, as I said a moment ago. Because you see, John, like all of Israel in his day, in the first century, had a clear set of expectations about what the Messiah would be like and what he would do when he burst on the scene. He would, after all, be their king, their deliverer, the one who would judge all unrighteousness and who would set them free from the oppression of their enemies. Another Moses and Joshua and David all rolled into one. By the time he baptized his cousin Jesus, John already had a clearly defined preconceived notion about him and even said that Jesus should be baptizing him. He probably felt that at the very least, Jesus would be even tougher than he was on the status quo. Both the religious and political establishments of the day. After all, John was constantly haranguing the Pharisees and the Sadducees with his message of repentance and even deliberately insulting them at the same time, calling them things like brood of vipers and hypocrites. And besides, John was living the life of a hermit, living out in the wilderness, out in the desert, depriving himself, wearing uncomfortable clothing and eating bugs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. All this was the game plan. So John thought, and essentially he had told his disciples, you think I'm tough on these bozos? You ain't seen nothing yet. 
just wait until Jesus, the Messiah, unloads on them. But then along comes Jesus, not as a conquering king, not as a stern judge, but as a humble teacher and healer. Not living austerely in the wilderness, but going from town to town, eating and drinking and going to banquets and weddings with all manner of people. Not crushing the oppressors under his heel, but healing the oppressed, lovingly extending the grace and mercy of God to all who would receive it. He just didn't fit the mold that John and everyone else had in mind. He didn't meet his expectations. Could he possibly still be the Messiah? Could John have been mistaken? And so he sends his disciples to Jesus to ask the provocative question, are you he who is to come, or shall we look for another? Has God ever failed to live up to your expectations? I'll wait. <laughs> Most of us have had the experience in our lives at some point of facing a crisis or at least facing a pressing need that we have prayed about and after praying about it have decided that God was going to resolve the crisis or fill the need in this or that particular way. You may have firmly believed it in your heart how God was going to resolve it. But then along comes God doing something thoroughly unexpected, utterly different from what you were sure he was going to do or even seemingly doing nothing at all. Has this ever happened to you? It's happened to a lot of people, right? Did it shake you when it happened? My guess is that at the very least, it caused you to question your own faith, or at least your ability, ability to hear from God. I believe that's what's happening with John here in this, uh, this passage. And so he asks the question that people all down through the ages since have had to get an answer to in one way or the other. And the answer he gets from Jesus is as unexpected as the activity that spawned the question in the first place. John was asking for a definitive answer from Jesus, a yes or no answer. But instead of answering the question, Jesus presents the evidence so that John can, in faith, decide for himself. Here's what we read in verses 4 through 6. And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the good news preached to them, and blessed is he who takes no offense at me. These words are actually a nearly direct quote from the Messianic prophecies of Isaiah in chapters 35 and 61 of Isaiah's prophecy. John would have recognized that. Jesus is saying this, this is what Isaiah prophesied that the ministry of Messiah would look like, and this is what you have heard and seen in me. In other words, you've heard my message, you've seen my miracles, you decide if I am he. John, like each and every one of us, was challenged to accept the claims of, faith, of, of Christ by faith. Jesus concludes his response to John with the words, and blessed is he who takes no offense at me. The Greek word translated as offense in English here is one from which we get the English word scandal or scandalize. So he's really saying this, blessed is he who was not scandalized because of me. In at least one translation, it's rendered this way, blessed is he who does not fall away on account of me. In Luke 2.34, the old prophet, prophet Simeon had said of the then infant Jesus, behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. In 1 Corinthians 1.23, St. Paul writes this, we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, 
and to the Greeks, foolishness. The point is that there was much in Jesus' words and in his actions, and ultimately in the way that he died, to offend certain people. And we see numerous instances of those people, particularly among the religious leaders, taking offense at him. Many people took offense at Jesus when he walked the earth. Many people take offense at Jesus today. But he says, blessed is he who does not take offense at me. And so his message to John is, in spite of the fact that I'm not the kind of Messiah you expected me to be, you will be blessed if you do not take offense in that. Now at this point in the narrative, Jesus does something interesting. John's disciples leave to convey to him Jesus' response to the question. Jesus then turns to the crowd in order to commend John to them. Why did he do that? He did that for two reasons. First, to reaffirm to the people that in spite of the fact that John was in prison, in spite of the fact that he had asked this question which seemed to be motivated out of doubt and dashed expectations, John was a mighty man of God. Jesus reminds the crowd that they didn't go out into the wilderness in order to see some fickle, spineless person who was swayed by the wind of popular opinion. He, nor did he go out there to, nor did they go out there to see a royal official living in the lap of luxury. To the contrary, they had gone out to see in John a man called by God to deliver bold, forthright, and consistent message of repentance, regardless of the consequences to him personally. They had gone out to see a man who was so sold out to the truth and to that call of God on his life that he lived in the desert, wore camel's hair for clothing, and lived off of whatever crude food he could eke out of the desert land. Jesus said of him that he was a prophet, and in fact, more than a prophet. John was called of God to be the vital link, the bridge between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. He was, in fact, the last prophet of the Old Testament and the herald of the New Testament. He was uniquely commissioned by God and invested with the spirit of Elijah to prepare the way for the Lamb of God and then point people directly to him. To enter the world stage at the most pivotal point in the history of mankind, to fulfill his mission and then to vacate the stage so that the one whom he heralded could fill it with his power and his presence. That's why Jesus then said this of him. <clears throat> Why then did you go out to see a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, who shall prepare the way before thee. But I said there was a second reason why Jesus gave such a ringing commendation of John. The reason was so that he could then make an incredible comparison between John and those of the kingdom of heaven. Specifically, he says this in verse 11, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has risen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Did you hear that? Did you hear what he said? Jesus makes two astounding statements in verse 11. First, that among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John. Not one, not Abraham, not Moses, not David. What Jesus was talking about here was not a moral superiority, nor a superiority of status on John's part, but he was referring to a man who had carried out a more important God-given mission than all of those godly men who preceded him. His ministry actually ushered in a new era of grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ 
that those godly men of old who had gone before him could only talk about and long for. The second astounding statement is, yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he, greater than John. Whoa, wait a minute. Not that John himself would not eventually be in the kingdom of heaven. Unquestionably, he would have been among those saints who had died and to whom Jesus would shortly open the gates of heaven at the time of his own death and resurrection. John was probably one of the very first ones in. But Jesus' reference here, during John's life on earth, to those in the kingdom of heaven, is to his disciples then and now who would receive him, who would receive Jesus by grace through faith and thus be numbered among those in the kingdom of heaven. And when Jesus says that the least of those is even greater than John the Baptist, it is because we don't have to ask the perplexing question that John had asked. Are you he who is to come, or shall we look for another? Because by faith, you and I have already accepted the answer. John could only foretell the saving, regenerating, transforming ministry of Jesus. He could only foretell it. You and I have experienced it. You and I have had it appropriated into our very lives by our baptism and by our walk of faith. And the very humblest believer in the Lord Jesus Christ today has the opportunity to give testimony of what that saving work means in his or her life. The lowliest believer today is the recipient of the lavish outpouring of God's grace in his or her life, while John the Baptist and those saints who went before him were at the time recipients only of the promise of that grace. That's why Jesus could say then, he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. And so brothers and sisters, in conclusion, I'm hoping this message will stir you. I'm hoping this message will be a great encouragement this morning, both to, to those who know Jesus in a personal way and an equally tremendous motivator to those who don't. If you're here this morning and you don't know, let me just say to you this morning that John's question, are you he who is to come into the world or shall we look for another? That question has been answered once and for all. Jesus Christ is he who was to come. And he came to forgive your sins. He came to give you new life, to transform you forever, and he came to open the gates of heaven for you. He has come, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. And so my encouragement to you today is accept by faith the relationship, the friendship that he's offering to you, that he extends to you today so that on that day, you will be numbered among those of whom Jesus said, he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.